Hello, everyone. Here I am in Lisbon, Portugal, attending a CEO conference, and also, most important, is looking at other investments uh, in the cannabis industry for Europe, uh, in particular, CBD creams and oils and ointments. Uh, so always staying busy and active, having fun. Today, I'm chatting with Frank Holmes from High Blockchain. In this interview, I ask about what's happening in Europe after Russia has cut off natural gas supplies to Europe. I ask about the crypto winter and what companies like Celsius have done to the crypto universe. We get into how Hive plans to use their balance sheet to acquire distressed assets. And of course, I had to sneak in a question about where Frank sees central bank policy heading from here. All right, everybody, sit back and enjoy the interview. Frank, thanks so much for joining us today. It's great to be with you. A little tired. I just flew in from uh, New York and Lisbon, Portugal. Okay, so let's let's start there. Um, you're up right now all over the headlines. Electricity prices are obviously flying a result of the... Russian invasion of Ukraine over the weekend. We found out that Russia was going to halt all gas supplies to Europe. Uh, what's the general, uh, I don't know, attitude or just uh, feelings when you're talking to people about what's happening in Europe right now? Well, I, I think they're still being duped. Uh, and one of the things that came out was that uh, uh, Putin's Gazprom and KGB were funding these NGOs. And these NGOs were able to get to the media and create all this hysteria and nuclear is bad. So immediately there's a, they shut down all their nuclear reactors here. Uh, you had to rely on Russian natural gas. And uh, it was all just a setup of, of fear mongering by, and the other thing they also did so well, uh, like the Matt Damon movie documentary about uh, fracking is so bad. It was funded by Gazprom. So you're seeing all this thing, that word is called FUD, you know, sp spreading false and uncertain uh, and doubting statements and comments. So th th that still is steep in this industry uh, and, and in the ecosystem over here. But people are very fearful about rising energy. Coal is coming back on stream. Uh, and, and so I th don't know how to unravel but I'm fortunate in the facilities that we have in northern Sweden, um, electricity prices and sentiment prices went up, but we always hedge. So we hedged out to two to three cents uh, last year before this invasion uh, takes place. And so hopefully by the end of this year, uh, this war will be over. Uh, and, and I think that that'll probably change some of the sentiment. But this, this climate change uh, backlash, you know, this whole idea of the World Economic Forum, uh, the reset button, there has to be a reset button on climate change policies. They're just too draconian. They're very inflationary. They embed inflation and they create supply chain disruptions. So this is going to be a big theme, I think, over the next 18 months. And I'm a big believer innovation is a solution to the problem. Okay. Now, I got to ask then, uh, where do you think that, that, that we're going here with Europe? Do you, do you think that we're going to see uh, Germany come out and change their tune towards nuclear power? Is, is there going to be more investment into alternative energies? I, 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 I know you don't change. have a crystal ball, but w yeah, what do you see happening? I think happening? there'll be a change in nuclear. I, I really do. I, I think that the protests are growing. You, know, you got to think of uh, the farmers here in Amsterdam. Uh, complaining, let's kill a million sheep because they fart too much with methane. I mean, come on, that, that's the solution. Yes, we, and you have to go kill a million cows uh, as part of it. And then Amsterdam Airport says, we have to cut back on the number of planes being able to land because of, of CO2. So now they're creating all these food inflation problems, supply chains, movement of people. So you're seeing protesters and farmers by farmers like we had truck drivers in Canada, uh, it's the farmers over here that are protesting. And we saw what happened in Sri Lanka. So I, I think that if they do not embrace uh, that the climate change policies are massively flawed, then they're going to have epic protests in the streets. 
changing gears here this morning here in Canada, the Bank of Canada put out their interest rate decision, another 75 basis points, taking the benchmark rate to 3.25%. Uh, I read a lot of financial media. There seems to be two schools of thought. One is that uh, they're going to keep going until, and when I say they, I'm just referring to central banks in general. We could be talking about the Fed or the Bank of Canada. Uh, we're going to see central banks continue to raise rates until they break something. And then there's going to be a, a, a pivot. Uh, and then there's a second school of thought, which is inflation's here to stay longer than it, than, than it was generally forecasted. Uh, we're going to see rate hikes continue or uh, at least get a little bit higher than here and and sit there for a few years to come. Where do you sit on this debate? I've always said that in the inflation numbers, the algorithm created in 1980, which when interest rates had to run to 20% to break inflation, which was over 12%. Uh, and we saw Volcker to the leadership and Canada followed suit. Inflation, if you use that model today, is 17%. So if mortgages are three and a half, four percent that's cheap money. It, it, it's it, it's the real inflation. And so real estate prices for the marginal has been coming off. Uh, and, and, but I think if you can afford, uh, it's just smart because the cost of construction, it, it, the, the, how much it falls is not going to go back to where it was pre-COVID. Because during COVID and after COVID, we had one quarter after another with climate change policies, just like in Canada, you had a lot of policies that took away the liberty of assembly, the liberty to protest, the liberty to comment on social media. So there's been so many regulations that have come all over that the average person wasn't aware of them. Uh, and the big showstopper was a 25% carbon tax in April the 1st in Canada. And that was, that's inflationary. Mm -hmm. So, so, so you think housing prices are going to uh, be higher than, uh, than, than yeah, the pre-pandemic? I think real assets, short-term real assets will come off. Uh, okay. because of the fear, there's a ratio of the, your cost of a mortgage for your income. So it's, it's all about that matching of the income. But if you can go and borrow at 5% mortgage and your income can easily cover it, then buy mm -hmm. because you're, you're buying something that's, that the cost of rebuilding and replacing is up substantially higher. Uh, and, and if you do have a big recession, the politicians will panic and they'll go with this MMMT, modern monetary theory, which means print more money. That's the solution mm -hmm. of the problem. Uh, so I, I think that in my opinion, now if rates were go really positive, that is above the CPI number, that would be different. But I don't think CPI is coming back to 2% uh, in, in my lifetime. I got to ask this, obviously, you are connected to crypto. How correlated do you think uh, central banking policy is to the crypto markets? Do you, do you think that uh, if you are a Bitcoin investor or a crypto investor, we should probably be a little bit nervous uh, if we see more rate hikes? You know, I've attended so many conferences and I've never seen a conference where the turnout is sold out, people spending $1,000 a ticket when the assets fall in 50%. Huh. The goal was to fall to $1,000 an ounce. You couldn't pay people to show up to a conference, never mind them paying to get in. These NFT conferences in New York sold out. Uh, recently, a couple months ago in, in June, in, in Austin, 15,000 people, $1,000 a ticket. Uh, all around the world. So the crypto, the crypto phenomena is is it doesn't matter that it's fallen. There's something going on of uh, this this concept of having decentralized assets and the way to be able to move money fluently uh, between you and I and not get stuck at the bank. Mm -hmm. yeah, a story that came out yesterday that I think sort of fell on, under the radar, anyways was Binance announcing that they're going to convert uh, USDC coins into uh, the Binance stable coin, it's the BUSD. Uh, what do you think is happening here? Do you think that Binance can ultimately be uh, 
a a big player uh, in the crypto market, or do you think that Binance is a problem that's going to have to be sort of resolved in order to have institutional investors want to participate in the crypto universe? The the biggest case study to, to on the other side of that Binance model is what happened to in the crypto winter. It was interesting that the very bottom took place. In, in, in March of, no, in February of 2019, when JP Morgan announced their own stable coin. So all mm -hmm. through the winter, they're bad multi crypto, crypto, and voila, here's my coin. That was the bottom. And just after that, Facebook announces their coin. And Bitcoin jumps to $14,000 from $3,000. Uh, and we saw a pile on by the G20 finance ministers because they, their concern was of any place that had three billion followers and they were to come out with their coin. So if anyone that becomes too big, that becomes a threat to the U.S. dollar and that mechanism, uh, will all of a sudden have a backlash with the G20 finance ministers. And the significant power of the U.S. dollar globally, uh, you're seeing the backlash happening with China and Russia, in particular China, in pushing for another currency for trading oil. Uh, all oil's trades have to go through the US dollars. Uh, the US will come in and confiscate your assets if you're a bad country. Uh, they sort of policing the world besides military, they're policing it through money. Uh, and so if finance was to come in there and all of a sudden have a token that big and powerful, I think you would have a pile on by the finance ministers of the world. Mm -hmm. And it's just, they've, they've they've certainly been uh, uh, they've caught the attention of regulators uh, globally. I think would be a fair assessment of uh, of Binance. And, and and there's so many cowboys in this. You know, in the first wave of, of when I joined the, and was involved in the co-creation of Hive, the there were so many cowboys that came in with these tokens uh, with false promises, and they were really pump and dump schemes. No corporate governance issue coins whenever they want, do these airdrops, all this hype. And it was just devastating how many crypto people themselves lost a lot of money in it. Now we've come through and the next intellectual wave has been leveraged. So we're going to take over the banks. We're going to create these uh, shadow banks like Celsius. And you give me your money, your deposit, and you're making nothing and making 1% at the bank. And I'm going to pay you 6 to 12%. So that whole idea of creating mm -hmm. quasi shadow banking, but there was no regulatory arm, no capital base for the Celsius of the world. And we saw all of a sudden this unraveling of highly leveraged debt. If you go back to 2008, Lehman Brothers was leveraged 33 to one. That means a 3% swing in their debt book wiped out their capital. Uh, these other companies were leveraged 100 to one. So now that was long-term capital story all over again. So this is all part of that winter uh, of, of all the sort of leverage to get yield. Well, you know, if you buy Bitcoin, it's made with electricity and it's made with equipment. So it's like a brick of gold, but it's a digital gold. When you go and buy these proof of stake coins, not proof of work coins, they're, they're made by a computer system. And the SEC believes that that is a security. So you're, you're now going into a very simple concept. If I put a $100 bill on the table, does it earn interest? No. If I put a gold brick on the table, does it earn interest? No. I have to go and put that brick or that dollar bill into a security to earn interest on that money. So therefore, mm -hmm. all those yield instruments were securities. And they yeah. were unregulated. So that these sort of rogue deals, et cetera, they make it easy for the regulatory world to come in to jump all over them and come on the crypto industry. So we're having a catharsis. It's a cleansing uh, of the next, of the last cycle. And, and I think we'll go into another evolution. So you mentioned Celsius. I've been super fascinated by Celsius over the last couple of years. We've, we've interviewed multiple people from Celsius. Uh, and if I'm just being flat out honest with you, 
it just didn't pass the basic smell test. Uh, I believe that when we first had somebody from Celsius on, I, th I think that they were the, the yields that they had up on their website it just didn't make sense, especially when we started asking questions about how do you guys actually generate that yield? It just, and and, and I flat out asked uh, Alex Mashinsky if it was a Ponzi scheme uh, to which he sort of uh, did his uh, dancing. Um, and, it and, show, I, and it shows it was, it needed a rising yeah. market to maintain that. Yeah. As, as, uh, so someone just sent me something today from the, um, from, from the investigation that uh, I, I don't have it in front of me, but um, it's, Leads me to the question, you're talking to a lot of people who are guys in the crypto community, obviously being chairman of Hive. I, I imagine that anybody who's an anybody in crypto you're talking to, was Celsius always sort of known to be a bad actor in the space? Was everybody kind of looking at them going, oh, this isn't going to end well? Or, or were they able to just sort of be a part of the community? You know, so some people that they didn't feel comfortable with them. Um, you know, I, and I met the CEO and, uh, I met the head trading guy, et cetera. And they all seemed straight up people, you know, as a, as there was no, uh, hype with them. But I remember when they said I should be, um, uh, I was criticized for not depositing our hundred million dollars of Ethereum coins with them and other people to earn a yield. And, and that was, so where's my collateral risk? I, I I must have those coins in my pocket and I can hypothecate, but you can't touch them if you fail to deliver um, and you couldn't get that. Oh, we can do that now. If you read, read their agreements, you could not get that. So it was basically uh, a very high risk trade. So the counterparty risk prevented Hive from ever lending the securities and, and, and great company, you know, there's great, great people like at BitFarms, you know, they, they did some uh, more money to go and buy more Bitcoin and they got tapped out. They just lost $70 million of realized gain and realized losses. Not that your inventory of coins went down and back up. You can have one quarter they're down, you lose. Next quarter they come back up. They lost. So uh, some of the other concerns, other crypto mining companies were uh, trying to earn a higher yield on their money. They just didn't. If, those that got stung did not read the fine print uh, on the hypothecation of your of your coins. So let's talk Hive. You guys announced an at the market offering agreement amounting to one hundred million dollars. What's the plan for the proceeds? Well, I think the bigger that's the, we've been very conscientious of delivering the highest returns on invested capital with the minimum amount of dilution. Uh, and, and it's interesting. I see some tweets saying some things. It's just fun. You know, I, I just scratched my head and and Riot went from 10 million to 100 million shares outstanding uh, over 18 months. Uh, and it was a non-event. We didn't do that. Um, so whenever we've done a financing, the last financing we did was close to 30 bucks a share. Uh, after that, we rolled it back five for one. So we have been very cognizant of if I get this money, how fast can I deploy to get my money back of my machines and what used to be in this business is as a nine month payback well now all of a sudden it was two year payback so we we just cut back you know we we're not going to make investing now we're seeing bankruptcies fire sales uh equipment uh s19 pros uh that were for a hundred dollars a tera ash you can buy them for 20 bucks so so there, there's Distressed assets you guys are looking at uh, potentially. Yeah, like it's and, and if I can get a distressed asset and I have electricity and I've been able to so far touch wood, I'm the most touch. I'm the most efficient miner. If you look at all the data that uh, Anthony Power puts out, we were the most efficient of what we've been able to do, and we've got zero premium for being green only for ESG. You know, right now in La Chute, Montreal, we have a forty thousand square foot building throwing off all this heat that heats a 200,000 square foot building that makes all the jacuzzis and whirlpools, et cetera, for Quebec. It's a French Canadian company, uh, Trivi. And, and so we recycle this green energy. So it's, it's no longer like a line item. Uh, we're now uh, doing planning out this and we've made press release on it before, but we should be close to finally finalizing our greenhouse in Sweden. And we'll take that heat 
and recycle and will become the cucumber kings of the, of the Nordic countries. Uh, so you don't have to ship stuff from Spain and Italy. We create a carbon credit with that. Uh, but we don't get a premium. Zero. And, and why? Because Ethereum and, and, and the Bitcoin Maximus. Well, I'm not a Maximus except for return on investor capital. And I've been able to mine Ethereum and, and take my exahash in Bitcoin mining from 300 to uh, two, uh, two exahash going to three exahash. So it, it, it's, you know, we are, we are really growing the business from it. So the big risk has been the merge and how fast this merge has accelerated. Uh, mm -hmm. And that to me is a great story of theft. You know, if you want to think of uh, confiscation of assets, like there's 30 million kids around the world that are gamers that are part-time using their GPU chips to mine Ethereum. That's all part of that ecosystem. That's going to be taken away, and that's going to go into an oligopoly of JP Morgan and Coinbase, and they're going to charge a higher yield uh, to basically move Ethereum around. So that proof of stake is really, oh, the argument has been we're going to save energy. So what we've noticed is spreading of FUD just like Putin did uh, with uh, with nuclear energy and, and coal in, in, in Europe, uh, we've seen the same thing happen on Bitcoin mining and Ethereum mining. Uh, and so now we're seeing the centralization of the Ethereum market. Uh, so I think the Ethereum Classic, which we mine, is going to become the darling because it's truly decentralized. Mm -hmm. okay, and we so mine Frank it. <laughs> so, so, so Frank, it's, it's, it's funny. You, you transitioned into my next question, uh, there about the, 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 the sentiment of Ethereum. So I got one last question for you. You're a guy who's obviously been a part of various successful deals, NASDAQ listed. Gotta ask you a last question here. What are you working on next? Can you give us a hint on what the next big Frank Holmes project is going to be? Well, one of the big exciting things is when you're in Sweden, the national sport is hockey. It's bigger than in small towns in Northern Ontario or Quebec. Uh, a town of 30,000 people, 6,000 uh, seat stadium for hockey arena. So it's now going to become the Hive Arena. But we're going to, we're doing the engineering to put machine, uh, uh, containers and the heat from the containers will heat the stadium. And we believe we can save them $200,000 a year. So the hmm. Bowdens Arena has become part of our ESG strategy. It's called the Hive Arena. And next we'll be recycling that heat to heat these facilities. And so can you imagine that all through Northern uh, Canada, uh, that the, uh, it doesn't become a line item to the community. Uh, you know, it's, it's very exciting. So they are the exciting parts where we can make money and we're able to go and, and have this other significant contribution to the community. Awesome. Frank, thanks so much for hopping on here. It's always a pleasure when we get to speak and uh, hopefully we can uh, catch up uh, in the future after we start to see this crypto winter uh, play itself out. I'm sure that Celsius isn't the last story that's going to be fascinating and uh, wish you continued success uh, uh, with Hive. Well, just to, when, when countries have a credit crisis, it takes four years to correct it because there's lawsuits and bankruptcies, et cetera. The crypto stuff is faster. It's going to take about nine months. Um, the, the whole process is very different. And interesting enough is that most of the people that lost the big money in, in Celsius were actually crypto people. They made a big score and they turned around and wanted a yield. And 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 uh, their big mistake in Voyager was taking retail people and, and telling them to come in with faulty ads to deposit to, to earn. That was the big mistake. Otherwise, it was in their... This yield mechanism was in their own metaverse. But I think the metaverse is going to grow. I think NFTs are going to grow. I think the trading of NFTs are going to grow. And I think the regulatory world in the US uh, is going to be much more focused on this proof of stake uh, versus proof of work. So we're focused on proof of work. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Frank. Uh, and uh, let's uh, let's let's chat uh, in the future and uh, Wheel, continue wheels to break up. down the uh, the the volatility that's happening in the crypto world. 
All right, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. If you could do me a big favor, hit that like button, subscribe and ring that notification bell and let us know what you think in the comments. All right. Thank you, everybody.